look for something. Okay, great. So that's the note. Well, uh, our agenda for today, we have a minute taker. We have blue sheets mentioned. We've done the note well. Uh, the agenda for today is just discussion of HTTP core issues, and then uh, the proposals of which we have one, which is the CDN cache control header. Um, I think I'd also like to inject here, if we can, a 30 second update on cache status and proxy status in BCP 56 space. Yeah, let's uh, start. Start with those. Okay. And does anybody have anything else? Okay. It's so not hearing any bashing. Um, okay, so uh, BCP 56 bis, um, we actually went to last call on it a long time ago and got consensus and we decided to park it until core shipped. In the meantime, I went back and looked at things and, and we got a few issues followed on it from folks. And so we've done some fairly substantial uh, rewrites of bits of it. <clears throat> not huge, but not small either. And um, I've more recently gone and adjusted it or started to adjust it uh, in terms of the making sure the references to core were, were correct. Um, I probably want to do one more pass on it and I think it's probably wise to do another working group last call on it since yeah. it has changed. So um, I, I'd actually be interested if, if a couple people could go and read it and, and uh, file any issues they see maybe as a, a bit of a warm up because this document, I don't think we've looked at it in so long. I'd like to maybe reacquaint myself with it and make sure that we're still comfortable with it and then go to working group last call in I don't know, a couple of weeks ish, if that makes sense. Um, well, I want to get it out the door, but I want to make sure that it still represents our current thinking. So, and, and also, um, you know, since we did this work, the HTTP API's working group has been chartered. Um, this document's a little bit different in, the, in that it's targeted just really at IETF efforts to create HTTP APIs or use HTTP for things other than browsers. Um, but I think it would still probably be courteous to pass it by them with that context and see if, if they have any comments. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, cache status is ready for working group last call, in my opinion, as the editor. Um, so, Tommy, whenever you want to do that. Yeah, I was going to start it um, now that we finished last call on core. Okay, great. And proxy status, I think we're almost ready for working group last call, but I want to take one more look at it with Peter. I'm pretty happy with its status though. Great. So we'll do that maybe right after we finish last call for cache status or around then. Okay. Um, any questions on any, any three of those? Okay. Um, so let's move on to HTTP core. Can people see uh, the issues list on the screen? A little larger might be nice, but. Your monitor is just too big. It is. In retrospect, I should have gotten a slightly smaller monitor, but yeah. Um, so we have, uh, I think, still 28 issues open. Of those, we have proposals for closing three. Um, I think probably a handful of the rest of those are editorial. These are the issues that uh, the editors thought would benefit from discussion at this meeting. Um, so we can go through these. Having said that, if, if people want to discuss any of the other issues, I think we have plenty of time to do that. Um, so maybe what we should do is start by going through these issues and then take a look at the rest of the issues list to make sure that nobody has any other input on those. Does it make sense? So I'm just going to go from the top here. Um, 751. <clears throat> uh, so Willie says intermediaries that process HTTP messages must send their own HTTP version and forwarded messages. Um, and he says, I'd rather say must send a version no higher than their own in forwarded messages. Uh, the reason being that he wants to uh, an intermediary when it forwards a message to be able to drop down versions. Uh, uh, to kind of advertise that perhaps one of its peers doesn't support a higher level protocol. Um, and, and I think there are a couple of aspects to this. From, from my memory, um, 
this was always a pretty firm requirement in HTTP that you send the highest possible version that you understand. You don't try and anticipate what your downstream uh, uh, peers uh, can do. And, and we should have a discussion about that because part of that mechanism was relying on the fact that VIA would advertise what your downstream, you know, the, the people upstream for you rather would uh, uh, would be capable of. And, and in practice, that people don't tend to send VIA, unfortunately, for whatever reason. Um, and, and the other is that, uh, um, what was the other bit? I forget what the other bit was, but it'll maybe come back to me. So I, I especially wanted Roy's comment on this one because I know you've got most of the history of this thing in your head. Well, I mean, it's it's basically what you said. I mean, the, the main reason it's a must is to encourage people to send the version they actually support because otherwise clients will send um, a safe version, what they consider to be the safe version first and, and respond and wait for the server to indicate first whether it's actually uh, a higher version or not. And in practice, then the servers will send back a safe response because they don't know what the, what the client's version is either. And it happens regardless of where, you know, whether we're talking about intermediaries or origin servers. Um, so, I mean, that's why it said must because it, we wanted to basically insist that clients send their highest, best, their best version or that people were, and pe when people responded, even if they only use the features of 1.0, they would say whether they supported 1.1 or not. That's what the history was. And um, it worked. It actually took very relatively small amount of time for the, the web to go from 1.0 to 1.1. Now, in terms of the change, I mean, we could certainly change that must to a should, um, or or make the change that Willie requests, which is to send a version no higher. I mean, that's certainly a, a valid requirement to make, but we also have to um, recognize that the, the version of the protocol is intended to perform that, uh, that additional purpose. So as right. as long as we document it, I think that's fine. Yeah, no, I, so, I think in the queue. Sorry. Um, so I think the requirement for must use your highest version is fine for clients and servers. I think for intermediaries in particular, this does make sense that an intermediary might not want to invoke everything that 1.1 supports when the client doesn't support 1.0 and it can't just stream it through. And so I, it makes sense to potentially have a different requirement on intermediaries than on clients and servers. Martin? Given Roy's context here, I might disagree with Mike here. I, I think there's there's two things in this. The first one is that when you generate a message, whether you're a client or a server or an intermediary, you understand the version of the message that you're generating. I think that's that's like the hard hard requirement that I think Willie's trying to get at. And the second one is Roy's point, which I think was really very good in the 1.1 era. Um, maybe less so when we're talking about 2 and 3, given the way that the the decision making goes, um, but that is a strong recommendation to pick the best version that you have available to you to make, particularly making a request, uh, because that largely determines how the server is going to respond to that request. And so, um, I, I think that saying both of those things might be valuable here. So the other thing that I, that I forgot earlier was that, that I'm assuming that this only applies to effectively minor versioning in HTTP 1 because it's in the H1 messaging document. Um, it, it doesn't really apply to 2 or 3. Um, and I think, I, personally, I could see uh, uh, maybe some wording around intermediaries, you know, intermediary-specific wording about requests when uh, there are buffering considerations. Um, 
acknowledging that you know if, if, if something along the lines of if, if an intermediary feels that it can't rely on via to, to, to understand you know or its peer can't rely on via to understand whether or not uh, uh, well maybe we should just say the intermediary should add via and then its peer will understand that there's a downstream client that's 1.0 I don't know And certainly that's what was, what the design was. Yeah, um, and, so. and the design isn't being honored, but the intermediary is kind of in, in control of its destiny here. You know, it can add, you know. And to some extent that feels like it comes back to a proxy's gonna do what proxy's gonna do, as Roberto would say. Yeah, I don't know how much of that behavior we should really encourage. Um, Alan was in queue. Gotcha, yeah, I, are we mostly concerned here about <clears throat> transfer chunk encoding and like default connection keep alive state, or is there some other one, one feature that 1.0 can't do? I mean, I, the way I view it is like if I'm in the upstream half of a intermediary and I am sending a message that's 1.1, even if the client that I'm acting on behalf of is 1.0, then I'm agreeing to downgrade that myself. And if I'm unwilling to do that, I shouldn't be sending a 1.1 request in the first place. What Willie's saying effectively, yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, the original design uh, was that you would just append a via header that basically says the downstream or the upstream, I always get those mixed up, uh, peer is uh, uh, 1.0. And then the server knows that it should, you know, try and buffer and send content length. So that's was that a requirement though? That it, like if I if I say I'm 1.1, but I'm the you know, but I'm acting on behalf of a 1.0 client, then the, the server is supposed to not use 1.1 one, one features when talking to me. No. Corey. I mean, I think my uh, question is a variation on Alan's one just there, which is not only it's not is it not a requirement. Is anyone aware of a server that behaves this way? Anyone aware of a server that checks via before it decides what features it should use when sending responses? I know that I'm not. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that Apache doesn't either. Mostly because we're we were trying to force that evolution. Uh, there, there are conditions under which we change our 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 own version back to 1.0, and it's specifically when when we know that the client is advertising 1.1 but is not compliant with the protocol. In that case, I do think perhaps there is some some work here to clarify. I think Willie might have something here unless we want to say, well, there is the design that people were supposed to be paying attention to and call that out much more clearly in the in the spec as something that, that servers should be looking at. Yeah, I think it's 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 worth thinking about and see if we can come up with a better way to phrase it. Um, I don't really have, but without the actual proposal yet, there's not much we can do until I'll actually write something. Martin's comment in the chat is that you know, we could essentially keep the text and make it a should, and then add context about why you may not. That seems a nice way out. And Julian, okay. you should move on. <laughs> okay. Do you, do you have what point. you need as editors? To I think so, yeah. Progress? Yeah, <laughs> great. Uh, next one. Oh, nice and fun. 740 oh. extreme trailers. Good morning. So, um, there's been a lot of back and forth about whether midstream trailers is something that we should accommodate in the spec. I think we had uh, uh, originally this discussion started, I think, in the quick working group. Um, and then 
we added something to the core specs to accommodate that if one of the birds of the protocol wanted to do midstream trailers or multiple trailer sections interleave with the body. Sorry, content, I think. Um, and the, the point is, is that no current version of HTTP has the capability to do this. Um, and I guess the question is, you know, do we want to include to, to we're effectively changing the signature of what HTTP is in terms of, you know, how people conceptualize it or how an API surfaces it um, by adding this. Is that something that's appropriate to do when we don't have any implementation or in terms of specification of, of a wire protocol? Um, discuss. Uh, Corey says no. Martin. Yeah, I don't know what Corey's saying no to, but um, Perhaps. My, my, my position here it was pretty simple. I looked at the document and it was very, very clear um, that it was describing a protocol that was deployed, apart from this bit. And um, this was basically the only thing that, that had no, no basis in reality, and that was a really jarring point in, in the document. I think this is something that could be done as an extension. We could adopt an item in the working group that's, that defined these semantics and also defined extensions to the various protocols that would allow them to be realized. And I think that would be a much better way to, to approach this problem. Um, I, I realize how, how annoying it is not to be able to do this after so many years, but um, I, I think that there probably is demand and we can do the extension work, but that doesn't have any place in the spec. Or is it uh, my, to clarify my no, my no was that I did not think it was appropriate to include this in the specification more or less for the same reasons that Martin just uh, outlined. I have no objection to the feature in general and I'd be more than happy to uh, see the working group adopt an extension. Does anyone disagree? Well, I, I think Martin is correct in every respect, except for that desire to get it done. But um, <laughs> the, uh, so I, I'm I'm willing to to certainly accept the working group's opinion on this. It's it's something that we can make proposals, but if the working group doesn't want to do it, then, then that's it. Julian, did you want to speak up? Well, the thing that trips me up a bit is the the fact that we actually put this into the core spec because in the quick HTTP work. The decision was made not to put that into H3 because the core specs do not define it. And then we defined it and then we were too late, apparently. But um, I mean, th there's a reason why, the, why this was put in. And as Roy pointed out in, a, in an earlier comment, there is an H2 extension that does this. So um, I really see no reason to remove that. Now that's in here. I mean, if we would discuss adding it right now, I would might have a different opinion. But now that it has been in there for several revisions of the draft and was put in for a very good reason, um, I'm a bit concerned about dropping it and saying if we need it, we'll extend the spec that we are just finishing. So that doesn't make any sense to me. Mike? So I'm kind of of two minds about this, but I think really to me it comes down to we don't have a concrete extension point to do this for semantics. There are easy extension points to do this for H2 and H3 if the semantics support it. I'm not a big fan of this proposal, but I think if there are people who want it, having it in the semantic spec to say there might be a way to define how these are transported, but no one has yet. 
I don't feel like that's too far out in left field for semantics to say. Just otherwise we don't uh, otherwise we have to create an extension point out of whole cloth for semantics when we're not even done with semantics. Mark. Oh, just personal two cents. Um, you know, H3 did not um, defer from doing this work because it wasn't in core. It didn't do it because uh, there wasn't concrete implementer interest. I'd characterize the discussion as it was brought up and people said, oh, that's a cool idea. Maybe we should do that someday. And then interest was lost. Um, I have yet to see somebody saying, I want to put this in my HP implementation today. And I am extremely concerned about doing this in core because there's already a lot of uncertainty and fuzziness about how trailers work in the world. And they are borderline unusable. We've done a lot of work in core to try to make them more usable and more consistent. And I don't want to add more fuzziness to it when somebody reads the spec and says, oh, look, trailers can do this, and then they find they can't. Or somebody creates an API, you know, that tries to expose this or doesn't and does it in different ways. We, we need interop to put it in the spec, and we don't have interop, especially if we want this to go to full standard. So I would, I think my preference would be at most to put a note in the spec that a future extension might do this. Or if we really have to keep this in the spec to confine it to a note and separate it from the other language about trailers to make it clear that it's not interoperable, it's not available yet. So to Mike and Julian's point, who I think are the only people who spoke up saying that we should keep some reference to this. Um, I mean, my, my sense is that if we have an extension, someone wants to do this, there's nothing stopping them from defining it even if semantics doesn't bring it like someone can extend that um what it, would you have a strong objection to be to having this be pulled like, would that cause a problem for the extensibility in the future given that it's not being used now um well for me uh the question of whether whether trailers come in the midstream would would have to be that would be and the end for them um in terms of an extension it would have to be independent of the existing um stuff that we have now which isn't terribly bad i mean it gives you a little bit more freedom mm -hmm. uh, as well it's just that um we would have to essentially close down the uh, headers and the trailers as they are today um and go back and revisit that text to do it. Um, but besides that, not really. I mean, we it basically we would close down the existing terms and then um, uh, do as Martin suggested, which is uh, develop an independent extension that would support all the platforms. And from my standpoint, I, I think characterizing my position as we should keep this text might be a little strong. Um, Sorry, not, I mean, that makes I, I understand, yeah. If, <laughs> if this is something the working group wants to pursue, I think it is reasonable to have it in semantics called out that abstract HTTP, there may be multiple instances of field sections here. Yeah. If, you know, if semantics says there are exactly, or there are up to two field sections, period, and then we introduce a way to carry three plus, then not every client is going to be able to interpret that. If we say up front that as a, you know, at a semantic layer, there are in the field sections, even though one uh, one is most common value of n, and protocols may determine how they're how they're carried. Then, at least we've given a signal. My concern is to some degree that if two is hard enough, given that so many people assume one, 
is defined I, and I totally agree with you on that. Encouraging good implementations because assuming that they read this nuance and then they they made their code handle n sections of fields is impossible to prove until we try it. Okay. Anyway. Um Q is growing solid. All right. So so this proposal is for HTTP two plus, or is it for uh, one dot one? We're we're talking specifically about the semantics document, so it's it's for all of HTTP. Oh, so it's, it's but independent of that. Right? But to be clear, this is only is how do you interpret it if you receive? It's not you have to you also have to also have the mechanism to send. So we're not defining a mechanism to send these. Um, right. Uh, but, but you can do it using two or three using extension frames, but you can't do yeah, it in, right now. In one, one dot one, um, some metadata, um, uh, can be sent in if it is chunked encoded, for example, so chunk encoding has, um, extra metadata, um, you know, name value pairs can be assi assigned there and there's an opportunity to send something in there. But buffered response, I don't see anything in it. And I don't even know what would it mean to have like, you know, already telling the client I have like, you know, 100 bytes to send. And then after 50 bytes, you just send some headers. Like, I mean, how is that going to be interpreted? Corey? Um, so to, I'm backing up a couple of sections to, to Mike's question about the semantics. Doc saying that if we, my recollection of what Mike said, it's a good thing I have the notes in front of me, is that uh, if semantics says there are exactly or up to two field sections, period, and we introduce a way to carry three plus, no client, not every client will be able to interpret that. Uh, I I don't see us, if we write in the semantics document, there may be N, I don't see us avoiding that problem at all. I think. Uh, Mark asked in chat, would any implementation change its API as a result? And I think this is exactly the right question. Who writes an API for a feature that doesn't exist in any deployed version of the protocol? You would have to change your wire implementation of the protocol to support these features if they were added. At that point, you would also tackle the semantic question of how they how they operate. But there's no point. No one's going to add code parts for the hypothetical midders that no one has deployed and there is no evidence that anyone will. It just seems like a very unusual way to build a protocol implementation. Now the goal would be not to have five different ways of interpreting the semantics. Mark? It just occurred to me that this is starting to have this, based on what Corey said, this is starting to have the smell of what I tend to refer to as hook-based standardization. Um, yep. And I feel like without implementation experience, I don't think we can have any confidence that we're actually going to do it right. <laughs> Does that mean you prefer misery-based standardization? <laughs> cool. Well, that, that's certainly my experience over 20 years. <laughs> sure. I mean, I've, I've literally, every single standard we've written is hope-based. <laughs> I don't understand that. But yes, I can I can uh, appreciate the sentiment. Speaking with my note taking hat on, I would like to thank Roy for clarifying that that was hope and not hook based standard. <laughs> which is what I heard. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, the, the sense I get is the majority of people think this is not practical. Is this something that we want to? Come on, like get a consensus on, or I don't know. my sense is that we should strike it, but I'm willing to. Well, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll take an action item to strike it if you want and, and put, put a proposal in. Um, and then, you know, if we decide to strike it, we can strike it. Yeah, yeah can we see, can you see the proposal for that? And from there. If anyone checks, speak up.
All right, next. Um, actually, okay. Uh, 733, arbitrary limitation on authentication parameters. Oh, another fun one. So I noticed that semantics requires credentials to be either token 68 or authparam. And my understanding of the history here is that token 68 was put into backport for um, basic. Um, but that's a very limited set of characters. And I was wondering why <clears throat> it doesn't allow uh, uh, colon, uh, for example, uh, because that rules out an authentication scheme carrying a, just a bare URL, which is maybe useful, for example, in a bearer authentication scheme. Um, and I was wondering if we can open up that character set, uh, obviously excluding any delimiters um, that, that might confuse it with all the param. Um, Julian pushed back, so I thought we should discuss it here. Well, I, the question I would have is not, we've had this requirement in there for almost 10 years now. And uh, what are we going to break by changing it? Um, well, and I guess that's part of it. I, I, I don't think that any, I, I would have a hard time understanding that any software out there is actually checking to make sure that an unknown authentication scheme conforms to token 68. Julian. So when we did that seven, eight years ago, the intent was to have a syntax that actually is compatible with basic, but to, to discourage the use of that syntax for any new scheme, because any new scheme that chooses that syntax will be non-extensible because you can't have both to token 68 or, or whatever we call and the list of auth params. It's either or or. So um, the idea was to, to make the existing set of authentication schemes actually conform to the grammar, but to make sure that everything new actually use auth params. And I think the goal should is is a good goal. And I don't see why there's a need to change something here. Because if you say, why don't we allow a colon here? Somebody might want to use that. The whole point of this design was to discourage the use of that syntax. Mm. So extending the set of characters uh, <coughs> in that um, variant of the syntax is contrary to that goal. Right. I think the problem for me is, is that I would like to be able to use a URI in a bearer token uh, because we just published the secret token uh, URI scheme and we already have people reaching out to try and do that. Um, and you can't really do that according to the specs because of this limitation in token 68. Um, and as you point out, bearer preceded the spec that still conforms to the basic syntax. Um, so. I, I suspect what's going to happen is, is people are going to want to use URIs in bearer tokens and the spec is going to say, oh, but you can't. And they're going to say, uh, well, you know, no software is actually going to restrict that. I'll just go ahead and use them. Um, and in fact, that's the discussion I've already had with one implementer who says, this looks really cool. I want to use these URIs in bearer tokens. I notice the spec says it can't. Oh, well. Yeah, but. Sorry, the bearer spec actually says that as well, right? So they want to break the bearer spec as well. Yeah. So why because don't they define strength. bearer too then? I mean, well, and so I guess that's you know, it is the right solution to create a fork in bearer authorization schemes, or is the right solution to adjust the two specs to admit that that is an artificially constrained set of characters? I think that's the, the root of the question here. Well, um, or, or sorry, and the third option is, is to have implementation diverge from uh, specification, which is where we're at right now. 
I mean, it would be it would have been really helpful to have that information on the ticket before because I didn't know what the background of that ah, sorry. proposal was. So, um, Martin was in queue, so that yep. sorry. Here, someone else to chime in. Fox. So, I I thought Julian's argument there was was kind of interesting in that. Um, there is a there is a path to including a URI in uh, an authorization or challenge or what have you, and all it requires is a little bit of quoting. You know, you have to put x equal and then du yes. double quotes, and you put the URI in, and then you close the double quotes, and everything everything's happy. It doesn't work with Vera necessarily, but do any of these people have a such a firm attachment to the use of the string Vera? I and mean, new authentication schemes are pretty cheap. They are. I, I guess it's, it, it comes back to that question of whether, you know, forking it and creating a new thing for people to have to understand and, and implementations to support is, is worth the, the hassle. Um, yeah, I, I don't think anyone actually cares about Vera per se. It, that is my I understanding because it's, it's just a tag. E, yeah, but people have a significant amount of deployed software and practice around it. Um, and, and I guess my instinct here is that it's easier for the few of us people in this room to adjust the spec than it is for the multitude of people who are already using Bearer to adjust their practice. There's some sort of priority of constituencies almost. Justin. Justin. Yeah, so my question here is, doesn't this, um, it, it, and I, I may be just, not understanding the layering of the specs here, so apologies, but uh, wouldn't having a more open definition in semantics allow bearer to effectively constrain it just for its own space? Um, because isn't isn't that what's being requested by this issue is to remove uh, the to token 68 character restriction here? To open it up. To add some more characters. Right. Yeah, exactly. So bearer would be able to effectively still exist um, and specify a subset, right? Right. So, we might need an update of the bearer spec, but yes. Right, exactly. Which we could bring up with the OAuth working group where I do a lot of my work. And um, honestly, thinking back to when we wrote 6750, where that comes from, um, I don't think that there was a lot of um, there was a lot of debate about uh, character set. It was just let's pick something that we know will probably work and put it there. So uh, if that does need to be uh, updated, but uh, I, one, I, I agree. I don't think that actual implementations will notice um, if the spec updates that. And two, I think that the um, uh, I think that room, you know keeping the core semantic specs such that they are not limited by a potentially arbitrary decision made by the OAuth working group many years ago um, is, is the right thing to do. Uh, furthermore, another avenue uh, for this that I'm, I'm just realizing is that uh, we are working on OAuth 2.1, which subsumes both 6749 and 6750. Um, it's not exactly a BIS document. Uh, it's the the obsolution thing is a little little weird, but um, we may be able to um, functionally redefine what goes in bearer there, and so that's something that we could actually bring up in um, in the OAuth working group. And as somebody who almost only accidentally is involved in the HTTP working group, I guarantee that the OAuth working group has no idea that this is even being talked about. Um, so how would uh, how would you guys propose that we liaise this between the groups? Well, I, 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 I'm a little hesitant to start a liaison in the sense that if we try and get a sense of the auth working group, I think we're going to add a significant delay to publishing these documents. And I don't think anybody really wants that. But yeah, yeah. as Martin says in chat, Justin, if you want to, you can carry a message uh, about what we do if we decide to make a change. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I will I will point the group um, at this issue with this discussion that you know the text in sixty seven fifty is is having, um, you know, is is causing some potential uh, uh, headaches. HTTP because that's not what we meant. Corey. Uh, I just wanted to note that I think it might surprise a surprising number of people using Bera that there is a spec for it. I think a wide range of Bera implementations just assume that you write the magic word Bera and then you put something there and that is the magic auth way. Yes. Uh, so I think in some senses the ship might have already sailed on this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, as an implementer, completely agree. Sorry to jump the queue, but that is that is 100% correct. Julian? So, um, the whole point of this ticket is that Mark wants to, or uh, was to align the spec with Mark anticipate, anticipates what happens in reality. So, um, I'm not sure whether it's happening yet, but if the intent is to use Barra with the URI instead of a base 64 something. We, we hopefully we agree that this breaks the syntax definition both in the HTTP speakers, HTTP spec and in the barrel spec. So even if we did change that in the HTTP spec, it would still break the barrel spec. The way to fix that is to fix the bearer spec to allow auth params instead of token 68. And then you can have sent all your URIs and multiple URIs and additional parameters as you like. And this does not require a change to HTTP, it does require a change to the bearer spec. Roy? Yeah, I, I guess my my problem is that it's also there to make it possible to um, parse this parse the field unambiguously, just because a URL could also contain the equals and the um, look like a parameter as well. So it's not as as simple as just changing it. I, I just I'm I'm a little frustrated that this even needs to be discussed because I don't see a need for the change. Mark. Um, so to respond to Julian, um, we, we could certainly update bearer. We could certainly, you know, go to those steps, but I would posit that no implementation is going to pay attention to that. Um, bearer is widely deployed. People use it, as was said before, people think that it is effectively an unstructured string afterwards. Whatever we write in these specifications is going to get ignored by those implementations. So given that you know, that is the way things are going. I would rather see the specifications re reflect the reality than what we would like the reality to be. Um, and regarding what Roy said, I, I'm not proposing we allow equals or anything else that makes it ambiguous in the field. So it would effectively be a constrained URI. It couldn't be any URI by the specs. I suspect people will still use any URI and it'll work just fine, but, you know, for spec purposes. Martin says, why not base 64 your URI? Um, I'll answer that real quick because the whole point of secret token is to make it easy to recognize late secrets. And if you encode them, you can't recognize them. Martin says, yes, you can. Okay, Justin. <laughs> yeah, so sorry, I did a little bit more historical digging. And just for this group's um, insight uh, the reason for this restriction in 6750 comes from the fact that OAuth tokens were uh, designed to be also passed as form parameters and as query parameters as such um, they needed to be url safe the idea was that your token would be url safe without any additional encoding uh, which is also why in the jose suite we use dots for separators and base 64 encoding and all of that like all, all of that just kind of falls together into this, um, you know, mutually compatible set of bad decisions. Um, 
So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that HTTP should change in order to um, facilitate uh, that, but if we can, at least in OAuth 1, have the guidance uh, for the, uh, you know, token construction and bearer uh, header usage uh, align with this reality, I, I think we'll be better off. Thank you, Mark. So uh, I don't want to burn too much time on this. If if we can't change the spec, that's fine. I'll probably just follow in a red on secret token saying that the example using a bear token in, in the letter violates the, the underlying specs, but in practice it should still work fine. Yeah. Um, I just thought that you know it might be worth something discussing. Um, so Tommy, however you want to declare consensus here will work for me. I I, I think my preferences are now. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like kind of the inertia here seems to be to keep it as is and not not expand in this definition right here. Um, yeah. I think that seems to be the best way to resolve this for now. Uh, this one, 729, Martin says, this text says the proxy doesn't store things like proxy authenticate unless the cache key includes the proxy identity. Um, I just wanted to do this live, uh, to make sure that you just weren't misunderstanding Martin. Um, this was talking about the cache being co-located with the client, not the proxy. So it, it's about. When I make a connection and 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 I'm computing a cache key for something I'm getting, the identity of the proxy I am using as a client factors into the cache key. Uh, is is that what you were thinking, or or are we just talking past each other here? I'm not sure. What yeah, I, th I think I think you're you pointing out that this was a client side cache was not obvious to me from context, but maybe I wasn't reading it and I don't have the context on the screen, so. Um, okay. Uh, as long as that's clear, then that's okay. But I, I read this as as a proxy cache, and at the point that the proxy puts its identity into the cache, that's kind of pointless. Yeah, no, absolutely. That that wouldn't make any sense. So I'll I'll try and clarify that. And, and yeah, I'll just call this a tutorial. Yeah, right. No. Just want to make sure that that was the misunderstanding that I was assuming it was. Good. Great. Uh, next one, 715, unknown preconditions aren't safe. Um, so this is, uh, I think the higher level issue here is how do we add preconditions to the protocol, uh, in a manner that is, can be relied upon by the client. Um, Martin, do you want to talk us through this a bit? Yeah, so. Having having sort of gone through the exercise of trying to define a precondition, um, when I was reading through this section, there, there wasn't a lot of support for anything in that in that area. And there's a very clear algorithm that you would follow that said, do this, then do this, then do this, then do this. But then it didn't really contemplate uh, the possibility that there were other preconditions. And um, there's a couple of things in there that sort of stood out when you when you read it that way. Um, and I think probably the quoted text is the worst offender. Um, and, but there's a bunch of other things that do mention it. Like, so the, there's the text that Roy quotes regarding the if web dev sort of generic precondition. And so um, there, there is some text on adding preconditions, but I don't think there's quite enough support. And I think it's, it's a little difficult to work through. Okay. I mean, from my perspective, just just adding preconditions is is hard. Right. Um, there are a lot of trade-offs, and there are no certainties. Um, 
So I, I, Roy self-assigned this. Roy, are you going to write up a, a, a proposal for this, just like a new little section? Or yeah, I'm. I can still do that. Okay. Thanks, Roy. Julian, did you want to comment? Yeah, so I, I, I can give a bit of context on WebDAV, surprisingly. So the one tricky thing is for a client to know whether the server actually understands the header field, and in WebDAV, this is negotiated over options. Um, the other thing is, um, as Martin pointed out, the fact that um, it's tricky to define the interaction if you have multiple conditional header fields in a request. And in the case of the WebDAV if header field, that's not, that hasn't been a problem in practice because um, for WebDAV, when you do authoring of resources, the assumption always was that you have e -tags. So all the last modified stuff is irrelevant anyway. And um, the functionality of the e based conditionals in HTTP is actually part of the if header field. So um, in, in the WebDAV design, the idea was that you would never in practice need to send, need to combine the if header field with some of the other conditional header fields. It would be always only the if header field because the if header field gives you, um, can express all the conditions that you have on ETEX anyway. So just as a context. I'm not claiming that it works very well, but um, that was the design. Yeah, in, in general, I would call it a, a self-fulfilling feature in the sense that if you don't fulfill it, the feature isn't going to work. Um, so generally speaking, you know, when people introduce these features, they make sure they work. Anything else in this box? So is the resolution <coughs> just to get a proposal from Roy? Yeah, I, I just want to make sure we were synced on this one. Yeah. So I don't think there's anything else to do. Great. Uh, that takes us to 697. So Martin pointed out that, that we still make claims about white space uh, in, oh, sorry, this is a different one. This is about, uh, White space in raw field values is removed when fields are parsed as part of semantics. So, you know, the claim is, is that when a, an implementation receives a field, it always removes leading and trailing in white space. Um, and, and Martin's wondering whether that's really true of all implementations in all situations. I think, I think this was largely a, an editorial comment, really. It, it, just, I think, needs to say that they might be, um, or maybe um, a particular version may specify rules that cause white space on, in field values to be removed. It, well, either of those two. I'm not sure it's that simple because things like matching field values depends on this. You know, the, the, how we specify the, the syntax of field values depends upon this. Uh, Roy? Well, oh, sorry. yeah. I was going to say, could is 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 it the strictly a requirement then that trailing and leading white space is removed? Oh, so so you say upgrade it to a must to make it clear. Well, if if that is indeed the case, if if you believe that matching is is important and white space must not apply for matching purposes, then say it. Yeah. Yeah, I think what's happened here is we 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 change the wording a little bit so it looks like we're actually physically removing the the bytes as opposed to what it's supposed to say is that the field content excludes that white space so it, it is essentially this is what happens when you interpret the field whenever you interpret the field you always skip the beginning white space and don't include the ending white space uh, it doesn't actually mean that you don't send or forward that white space with messages so they're not, it's not actually removed from the message. They're just not interpreted. I, I okay. think that's an excellent clarification, yeah. Ah, so that, that's that's very different to what I'm reading from this, which is that um, messaging itself um, defines the white space as part of its um, internal structure 
And so the, the white space that surrounds something in, in messaging in 1.1 doesn't actually, the value is not, does not include that white space. Um, right. So, so we're, we are agreeing with the PR, uh, with the, uh, with the issue in the sense that, that yeah. we should fix that. Okay. Good. All good. Yeah. Did you want to say? So I'm, I'm looking at the HTTP2 spec and in the security considerations, it says that any value that is any character in a field value, which is not permitted in the header fields production of HTTP should um, must cause the request or response to be treated as malformed. In H2, yes. Yeah, so, and I was wondering whether the implementations actually do that, because that would be good. I mean, the concern is that the H2 and H3 way of sending header fields actually allows characters in places that the HTTP 1.1 wire protocol does not. And at some point of time, those might actually creep into use. So I was wondering whether this must requirement, which for some reason is in the, in the security considerations and not somewhere else, is actually implemented. Question? Yeah, so I suspect that this is not implemented as, as stated, though um, there, there are various ways in which it might be. So if, if there are carriage return line feeds in header field values, I, I suspect that some implementations are going to be causing that, to, treating that as bad, or the null character, the zero byte, um, might similarly be regarded as, as being bad. But I'm not sure that it's true that um, if something doesn't doesn't fit the, the grammar of a particular header field, uh, implementations will be dropping those. So if, for instance, you have a parameter that contains a bearer token that contains a non-token 68, for instance, I don't think implementations will be dropping the entire message as a result of that. So um, there, may, there may be some work to do in H2 there. Um, yeah, but, but, but that was, wasn't actually not my point. So my point is that the spec says valid characters are defined by the field content A, B, and F rule of HTTP. And it says if a character is not permitted in the field value, right. the request must be treated as malformed. So leading and trailing white space is not allowed in field content. So I was wondering whether any H2 implementation enforces that. Not that I'm aware of, um, yeah. but um, th that was always the intent. The, in the intent was to make sure that the leading and trailing white space was removed. I think we need to open an issue on H2 there. Yeah. Cool. I just to follow up to Martin, I, I have a vague recollection of having filed some issues against core on this as well. Uh, it's not even clear to me that those characters are effectively policed in a H1, let alone in H2. There are definitely cases of uh, CR in header field values, for example, being uh, allowed through in existing implementations. So uh, it's possible there's alignment here more broadly. I'm not proposing that the text is wrong per se, but just to answer Julian's question of whether or not implementations reject it. Uh, I don't even think all the H1 implementations reject it, let alone the H2 ones. All right. So it sounds like we can clarify the text. It's still in queue, by the way. Hmm? Julian's uh, still in queue. Or I guess Julian had spoken before Corey, so I didn't know if he had more. Sorry. You were in queue. Sorry. Say more. more? Yes. <laughs> He's in queue again. <laughs> Go for it. No, he just dequeued and re dequeued. Oh, <laughs> I think, Julian, now you're at negative one in the queue. <laughs> so if you come back again. All right. Um, all right. So it sounds like we can clarify the, the text to 
about what it means to remove and how that's one of the fields interpreted and we'll make that a requirement. Is, is that enough for you, the editors to make that change for good? Okay. I think so. I think Roy, you self-assigned this, that, that looks okay. Okay. Uh, here we go. 687. <clears throat> It'll be a good protocol. <laughs> I don't, I don't. This is great. Keep it. So this is the, the text in debate. I don't know how much time we want to spend on this, but it should probably be time bounded. That's all I'll say. I mean, our interim call ends at, you know, in 50 minutes, so no more than that. Can, can I first of all ask Martin, how strongly do you feel about this? Uh, this is this is just another one of those things that it just it's just weird um, for someone to say something like this in a in a protocol spec, uh, particularly with twenty one nineteen language attached to it. I I sort of get where Roy's coming from here, but um, we don't say this anywhere else ever in my experience, and. It, the truth is subjective, is all I have to say. Well, I like the internet weird. Mike? This is a great aspirational statement. It's not a protocol requirement. And yet we've been enforcing it for 20 years now. So it is a protocol requirement because we made one. Have we been enforcing it? Or have mm -hmm. we just been saying we've been enforcing it? <laughs> oh, we did. Is that a requirement on the implementations or a requirement on the deployments? It's a requirement on the interpretation. But you're, you're, you're placing the requirement on a sender. Yes. The requirement on a sender is that the syntax that they're sending actually reflects what they are stating in the syntax. You know, so it's effectively what, what Martin says, you must not lie. The effect of that on the recipients is they don't have to go by the syntax alone as their basis of an inter interoperating via HTTP. They can interpret a um, something that they know to be a lie as not standard. They don't need to respond according to the standard. So the enforcement to... is on the receiver. Then, like, could, could we just phrase the sentence such that a receiver know, must not accept or may reject or whatever anything that they detect to be a lie? But, well, I mean, you could say a, a recipient may ignore any protocol elements that are that are known to be sent as a lie, but it's it's just not, you know. It's not influencing the right people. So. Okay. Mike? I, I feel like enforcement at that level gets, that belongs in the semantics of whatever the protocol element is that you are enforcing or acting on. So like P3P or do not track, okay, Fine, they have their own semantics, but at the layer of layer of HTTP protocol, this this feels like a nonsense requirement. 
Now, it, if do not track wants to add a requirement that this header field must not be sent if the user did not explicitly opt into it, must not be sent in the normal case, whatever. That, you know, the whole point is the standards already say something like that. Mm -hmm. DNT in particular said that. And then one company decided that, no, they're going to send it anyways because they know better. Um, so, I mean, that that's a very specific example where the HTTP spec overrides their opinion about another, you know, spec semantics. Um, so it's, uh, it's not a question of, of this is going to force someone not to lie. It's a question of how do you recover from that situation? How do you deal with the, um, the consequence and still label yourself as being conformant while you're here on the other side is not conforming. And I think that belongs and, as you say, is in the DNT spec, not HTTP. We're not going to do this 50 times. It's why, why repeat the same thing in every single spec in the IETF plus the W3C when you can do it in one place? It doesn't make any sense. Mark, do you want to Am I muted? You're good. Um, so I, I think P3P and DNT are exactly the right specs to use as examples here. I worked on P3P, Roy, you worked on DNT. Um, and in the case of P3P, we had people still today, even though it's not really implemented by any browsers, making false P3P policies so that the browser would behave in a certain way, uh, even though they didn't mean what they were saying. And in DNT, as you well know, a browser announced that it, you know, uh, an intent that was supposed to be the intent of the user when it wasn't. Um, no one looked to the HTTP spec for a requirement that said, are you lying or not? No one looked to those specs, the P3P or DNT, for a requirement about whether you were lying or not. What people looked to was the specifications and the intended semantics. And then they went and said, well, is there a legal backup for these semantics? Is there a legal requirement to shore that up? And both failed because there wasn't in those contexts. And I know that there's movement in certain places and so forth. But this requirement is a no-op. It, it doesn't do anything. It's not a matter of whether it belongs here or the other specs. It doesn't belong in any of them because this isn't the domain of architecture. This isn't the domain of the protocols we define. This is a much more complex social, legal, it's norms, it's it's law, it's not it's architecture. Semantics. Yes. Semantics, and so we define the semantics. Is, semantics is by definition meaning. If you yes. don't mean what you say, it's a semantics issue. No, we define the semantics. Yes, we define the semantics. We don't when define I, when we the requirements exchange to... a sentence to each other and I say something and you hear the other thing. The only reason we have any agreement on what we talked about is because the meaning of the terms are shared by both of us. When we lose that meaning, we lose interoperability. We lose the ability to, to understand each other. That is the essence yes. of semantics. I hope it is agree, an architecture requirement. But our responsibility and our authority stops at defining the semantics, not the meta requirement that you have to use them properly. That, that's not within our authority. Yeah, if only the fair. world were run by us, but it's not. <laughs> Still don't care. Um, okay. Yeah, so um, I, I think Mark articulated this reasonably well here. Um, I think the when someone decides to present uh, semantically false information in a protocol element, and here I was specifically concerned about the content and of a of, of a response that is the representation of a resource. So if a if a resource decides to provide information that is false, um, that's it's not a protocol um, problem. It because the semantics are still clear. The fact that the um, the element generating the information intended to provide a falsehood is um, is something that's on them, not the protocol. And I think we're we're best striking this. 
Right. No, you're not getting that the point. When you respond to that element that was sent to you, are you standards compliant when you respond in a way that differs from what the standard says you should do? I, I don't care at that point. Um, if the semantics oh, are clear, the semantics are clear, uh, whether, the, whether it no. re relates to a falsehood or not. The semantics are clear in the messaging. So when you receive a message, it says a set of semantics. But if you know the person on the other side is lying to you, can you ignore what they said and respond in a non-compliant way to what they said right. because they lied to you? I think, I think you're entirely is, entitled to do whatever you want with that information. Exactly. Right. The case. And so, you're entitled to do whatever you want to do with that information. Okay. And you're still compliant with the standard. We're making progress. James? Boy here, so uh, this is uh, very interesting. Uh, I I guess my question is, if you find out that someone's lying, what do you do about it? What's your sanction? What's your remedy? And therefore, I'm intending to agree with Mark because it seems to go well beyond the scope of the bits and bytes that we're dealing with. Yeah. Guys, do remember that our protocols are not just implemented by technical people. Our protocols are examined by governments. And governments look to the protocols to determine what we expect in terms of our interactions, what we expect in terms of our communications. It's not as simple as saying, well, what can you do at that point? Because you can do things at that point. You have justifications to do things at that point if you can show that that's part of the protocol. Mark? Absolutely agreed, Roy, but I don't see how this requirement helps a, a competition regulator or a legislator or a court make that determination. It, it, they will be looking at the concrete semantics of each individual element and making their decisions based on that. This general requirement doesn't add anything to that. Yeah. And that they won't even know it's there. If, if there was, and, and I said this in chat, if there's one example of, of a place where, where this would make a difference in those determinations, I'd be all for it. I think we need everything possible to support correct legal interpretation of the protocols. I just don't think this helps at all. Well, all I could say is it helped me when I was working with 70 lawyers and 40 regulators from governments around the world. It helped. I, did, can't, did this... I can't translate that into technical terms, but it definitely helped. So, Roy, did did this specific text help or did the general yes. notion help? This specific text was put in HTTP to solve that situation because it no, specifically no. resolved a dispute between whether the clients could say whatever they wanted or servers were allowed to interpret lies as lies. Do you have any, any pointers to minutes or anything for that? Because I'd be fascinated in that. I... I wouldn't know where they are. They'd be in the okay. W3C somewhere. In in DNT discussions? Yeah. But I don't I don't okay. I don't if know you if those were actually minuted or not. Okay. If you can help me find that, I'd be immensely grateful. Right, I'm just you know trying to you know read the room overall. I, I think in general the working group is not supportive of the text as is. Now what I'm hearing, what you're saying, I, I do understand and appreciate that point. And I'm just, I'm wondering, like, can we have a compromise here in which we don't have that particular sentence as is, but we do be very explicit that if a recipient receives something that they can, that they detect as a lie, they can do whatever they want. And that essentially their social contract with the other peers gone and they can reject it they can they don't have to be spec conforming after that point like they are within their rights to respond however they want or not respond does that um, solve the same fundamental problem yes it solves the same fundamental problem it doesn't quite target the responsible party but yes it does right i, I just think like if, if we're trying to 
it feels like give, putting a normative requirement on the responsible party who could ignore everything anyway is not necessarily productive. While what we want to do is give uh, the, the freedom or the you know, the blessing for the, the good party who's detecting the problem to not be non-conformant if they reject people that they detect as doing malicious things. Yeah, I, I can explain. The, the distinction is that when you go to a regulator and you say, this person is not following the standard, here's the example. Here's the requirement where they are not following the standard. And you don't have a requirement associated with what they're not allowed to do. It's much more difficult than saying that, look, I'm allowed to do whatever I want because this says you're not allowed to lie. It's, it's, a, it's a minor distinction, but yeah, the, it does make a difference. But you know, if, if someone can come up with a better way to phrase it, then we can certainly rephrase the requirement. I, I feel like the, the issue is that different fields do have different levels of sensitivity here. And like DNT so can say that it, you know, it needs to be accurate. And we don't want the HIV spec to be harmful in saying that, oh yeah, the recipient has to do all the right things in response. Like, no, we can make sure that the re recipient can do whatever they want if they detect the lie. But at the same time, I think beyond the fact that this is not really enforceable, for, for testing purposes, I may put a fake location header in or whatever, just to do something like, and I don't, that doesn't, mean that I am immediately non-conforming, that I can't do this if I want to within a situation where the recipient is okay with that response. Anyway, um, could we get a PR that removes this particular requirement, but maybe put some non-normative or text about what recipients' rights are? Oh, sorry, Mark, I didn't see you in the queue. Sorry. I, I, I... I have to say, I, you know, I, I'm still surprised at, at Roy's assertions here, um, but I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt in that certainly in, in the P3P discussions, the, the arguments he's making about people saying, look, I can say whatever I want in the protocol was an argument made by some parties. Um, what I'm skeptical about is that, that a court or, 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 or another legal authority would pay attention to protocol conformance as an indicator of legality. but on the other hand, I don't think that this requirement is actually harmful to include in the spec beyond harming protocol designers' sensibilities. Um, and in the prior constituencies, that's pretty low. So my question is, does, you know, does anyone violently object to this or are people just not liking the smell of it as, as, as a spec? I, I, frankly, I, I don't think it does a lot of harm in the spec. It's just weird. Um, and I'm willing to leave it if, if Roy feels this strongly about it. Pardon? We use, we use normative language to achieve interoperability and, and Roy's making an argument about interoperability here, or at least it seems to be attempting to make an argument about interoperability. Uh, and um, I don't think that's well grounded I do kind of like the idea that we have something in the specification that perhaps not normative to support the sorts of things that we're talking about here. Um, but I don't see any normative interoperability requirement derived from this that makes any sense. Well, this goes to do lawyers pay attention to, to RFC 2119 or not? Oh, of course they don't. Oh, it's pretty popular. It's actually quite popular. James? Hi. Um, I guess uh, I'm new to all of this, but um, I posted a couple of links uh, into the chat window that perhaps are relevant to this conversation. And I suppose this, the summary of this is, is this the right place to address this problem? But I do agree it's a problem. So um, we have the global uh, privacy um, control flag, which I think is an extension of do not track. Um, and to me, this is quite problematic because if someone's receiving this indicator, 
um, but wishes to exercise their right as far as privacy is concerned in a way different to the flag being transmitted, what is their legal obligation to accept the flag, for example? I know that's not perhaps this precise scenario that was intended, but perhaps it's one that's um, relevant. Um, then if we go to a privacy budget, for an example, a proposal um, in a relation to the information that's sent over these protocols, it's specifically contemplating lying uh, under certain conditions. So I, I definitely see this as a problem. And having listened to you all, I, I, I still see it as a problem, if not more than I did 10 minutes ago. Um, I guess I don't know whether this is the best place to address it, but it certainly feels like something that, that should be something that we, we spend more time talking about in the coming months and year because it's getting real and is more of a problem than perhaps it has been in the past. Um, I would also like to support whoever said that do lawyers look at the, the protocols? Yes, they don't understand them, um, but they're increasingly looking at the, the documents that the ITF and the W3C produce. Um, so uh, this is important. So I wouldn't just sort of leave it there if the intention is that nothing would be done about it. Um, it's better to be clearer one way or the other. Might help if we could get a sense of, of who can live with it as is and who feels like we need to change it, maybe. Mm, it would be nice if we had specific proposals. So I guess do people want to speak up or put your name in the chat if you cannot live with it. Martin saying just removed must not and reword. Okay. No one's saying that they can't live with it. <laughs> not, but we know you will. And then for Rory, like, 16119 has a new life, yes. Roy, could you live with it being non-normative, not not having a technical must, capital must not? Well, I'm generally hoping to live regardless. Um, yeah, sorry. The uh, yeah, I hope you live. <laughs> I'm not putting my life in the hands of a working group. God damn it! <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, um, there are different ways of phrasing it that I I'd be willing to. To wander past, um, I don't have any reason to remove the requirement, and I have no desire to. Uh, there's certainly nothing preventing me from accepting the working group's decision, but it's, you know, if you want my opinion, it, it would be a horrifyingly bad decision to remove it. And believe me, I don't say that very often. <laughs> Julian? So uh, I think that was a very interesting discussion. Um, I believe the reason why people read the sentence and think, what the hell? <laughs> because they do not understand why it's there. Yeah. And maybe they had all the information that was just yeah. presented that would help. So, Maybe we can have an aside somewhere that explains, maybe even mentioning do not track, but maybe just a uh, invented header field, what this is about. And then maybe people are more comfortable with that yeah. environment. And I, I think I agree with Roy that if this is not in a must not in uppercase characters, then those people to who this is addressed will ignore it. So I think um, there was a very good reason to put this in. And just to clarify, this is not new text. This is text that we agreed upon six or seven years ago, right? So the proposal is to change that. So this is what the current spec already says. Mm -hmm. It's not something that Roy put in 
in, in since the last revision. It has been there for a, for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> say, there's a lot of stuff in the document Julian, that I just put in. Julian, don't tell them about that. <laughs> uh, uh, we got a couple plus ones, and then Corey is also in the queue. Mine is just a wordy of plus one. Uh, I think Julian's insight here is relevant. I think the one caution I want to add is that uh, this has got to be the most widely broken normative requirement in this specification <laughs> because of Tommy's, I mean, Tommy's note about uh, testing is a particularly good example. Like we routinely lie when we uh, implement protocols in this way. So I, I think the, the most cautious note I have to add is uh, language that clarifies around this uh, might, might want to be very careful to not undermine the reason Roy put the must not language there to begin with. It's going to be a hard line to walk to say you must not lie, except we know you will lie, but only do the good lies, not the bad lies. I don't think lawyers like that kind of language. Um, so no. that's going to be a little tricky. To be clear, I mean, that's normal. I mean, it's normal to have, you know, things where you're testing and you're, you're lying about the testing. That's not a matter of, you know, you're not, when you violate a requirement, it doesn't mean the, the sky falls. It means that the interoperability is not going to be there that you expect. Yes, I agree with that. Uh, again, it's one of those things that uh, I think is often the nuance on that is often missed. People tend to read every uh, normative word with the same weight, especially early on, and that can be a little bit tricky. Yeah, and I should probably say, to be clear, the problem with DNT particularly was that people were lying, and then the servers were trying to ask the user to do things that the user had no idea what to do because they hadn't set set sent the uh, the request to begin with. So it was, it was causing an interoperability at multiple layers that there was nothing the servers could do about it because you can't expect users to know what on earth is going on in HTTP, but you can expect at least the clients and the servers to be talking the same language. So, I mean, that's, that's how it came from. Um, but we are actually, you know, to be clear, the, this particular requirement has been in the spec a lot longer than that. It just wasn't phrased the way it is right now as a requirement. Mm -hmm. Cool. So it sounds like we, oh, Mike, got a comment. Um, sad conversation was just reminding me when we talk about whether lawyers get into this. I will point out that I was at Microsoft in the time when we were legally obligated to document and disclose any time we deviated from requirements in the protocol specs. And a must like this makes those conversations very interesting. But it also gives you the escape hatch that I think is, is Roy's point. Yeah. And I, I still don't like this must not. But I think Roy's point that there needs to be an escape hatch when a server detects something going on is well taken. Okay. So we have the question in chat from Mark about who will make the PR. Roy, is this something that you wanted to propose? Kind of a beefier text around to explain the context for this and the kind of the audience? Yes, I, I can certainly propose improvements, uh, rephrasings of the text. If someone wants to propose a PR to remove the whole bit, that's, you know, they, they're they welcome to propose a PR, but I'm not going to apply that right now. Well, I mean, I think it, it's clear that no one feels as strongly about removing it as you do about keeping it in. And I think the through the discussion, the point makes sense, but it's also clear that for someone doing a read through the document, the context isn't clear as it is, and it just raises the, you know, the uh, pedantic reader's alarm bells of like, oh, you can't enforce that. So like couching it will, I think, strengthen the point as well. Sure. Yeah. Press comment. Go for it. Cool. Uh, just two left. 683. 
Uh, our old friends, the control characters. And so I think as part of core, we put in explicit requirements about handling control header uh, control characters in in field values. We may have gone too far in that. And this issue is about the details of that decision. Um, and Anna points out what Fetch says, which is relevant at least to browsers. And so it's no linear trailing tab or space bytes, which is interesting to a previous discussion. And it contains no null or new line bytes. So that's a much wider definition of what can be in a field value. Uh, if, if folks recall, we've always been historically quite open about what a field value can contain because it you know, has been that way for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we're talking about CR and we're talking about control characters. Yeah, traditionally we sort of allowed whatever was capable of robustly handling, even though um, for for interop reasons we required a a constrained character set. So we had requirements that restricted us to ASCII, but then we also said, eh, except anything that's okay. Someone should go back and um, like. We all talk about going back in, in time to remove all the bad things from the past. And one of the bad things in the past is the robustness principle. Um, <laughs> but Roy's probably right. Once once you've made the decision to accept the the um, the junk, then you have to accept the junk forever. And that's where we're at. And so I think probably the right decision here is something along the lines of what what's in, in Fetch is having, having a hard requirement, not for carriage return line feed or uh, the the zero byte, and um, strongly recommending that you use the things that actually achieve interoperability, which does include control characters and actually has everything that conforms to the ABNF for whatever header field you're um, exchanging. And beyond that, well, maybe if you don't understand what the field is, pass it. I can't tell you how many times I wish we could go back and move UTF-8 before HTTP was created. Oh, um, wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> uh, Actually, yeah. I'm going to disagree with that. UTF-8 is a dog's <laughs> breakfast for this purpose. <laughs> it would have I, solved I so many problems. I don't think we would need UTF-8 for, exactly. for the head of field productions. But at the same time, there's a lot of artifacts that come from having whatever ISO 8559, 8859 or whatever. Um, right. Yeah, not, not cool. Does this make sense? Yeah, I think that's it. Basically saying that if you use control characters, you're not guaranteed to get anything interoperable, but you might want to pass them through anyway. Now, do we need to talk about the security issues involved in CR perhaps? without firmly, you know, refusing them? Yeah, I think so. Um, so there's, there's carriage return and then there's line feed and yeah. CR is a particularly tricky one. We yeah. currently require CR to be replaced, to removed or replaced with space. Right. right. But, and we're talking about dropping that, right? Are we? The gist of the discussion, I think. So, so I, I think, um, I mean, the difference between what we have right now and what the published spec says is that we say that if you receive control characters, and that's not about CR, but about the others, you must either reject the thing or convert those to white space. And that's a new requirement that we put in. And the question is, if we take out that requirement, are we okay? 
because that would be wonderful because then we would be just saying what we said before and we won't have to spend too much brain cells on that. I mean, um, allowing C CR to be treated as CR uh, is probably asking for trouble, right? I yeah, mean, yeah, we can't do that because um, I mean, within with existing servers, that becomes a security hole on the clients, and we're slowly trying to close that off. Uh, it didn't exist before, but now it is a security hole with clients. So basically, people are filing um, vulnerability uh, statements against the servers for not removing bare CR because it now causes um, uh, request smuggling in, in clients that for some reason have decided to interpret bare CR as a line, line break. So my understanding then is that we're going to say that CR and null have to be replaced by space, and we're just going to strongly caution against the rest of control. Is that where we're at? Sounds like it. I think um, we need to allow the recipient to Treat CR and null as broken messages. Yes. So we don't require them to be converted to be white space, but what we can say is that if you don't uh, consider those invalid, then you may replace them by white space instead. And must replace them by white space instead. So essentially, we are relaxing the new requirements to only apply to null and CR. Yeah. And LF? Yeah. Okay. It's actually NUL for null, if you want to be entirely accurate. Sure. Oh, I <laughs> cool. All right. That's a thing of beauty. Okay. Last one. I think the question here was whether we move 1945 to obsolete or historic. If it's obsolete, then these documents should obsolete it. If it's historic, we can do that outside of this process. Um, my two cents is that historic might make sense, but I don't even know that it does, but I don't think we need, I think we can close this yeah. collection. It, yeah. it certainly seems like if we did anything, it would be historic rather than obsoleted. Like where I was saying, in which case it's not a problem for core. It just makes me feel old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, history. Hey, Roy, should I should I disambiguate this for you then? There we go. <laughs> okay. Martin, you are right with us. I can live with that. I I just asked the question because we did this in TLS when we defined TLS 1.3, we obsolete 1.2, and so on down the chain. Uh, it seems like this is a different protocol. Yeah. yeah. You're on the queue? Julian? Or, uh, is he in the queue or is that a plus one? I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. Or yeah, maybe that's a plus one for that resolution. Uh, does anybody have any of the other issues on the list that they want to talk about that we didn't already discuss? Okay. 
and Julian and Roy, did you have any other ones that, that popped to mind that we'd like direction from the working group on? Okay, I guess we're done with this. All right, thank you. Cool. Do, you, um, do the editors have an estimate of when we think we'll get the issue list back down and another cut to send off to the ASG? It will reflect our very best effort. I am sure of that. Um, All right. I, I, I think probably a few weeks, okay. um, yeah. but only a few. Cool. Does that seem to make sense? Yeah, to I'd say roughly two. Um, did did you want to talk about um, uh, should we put upgrade in the other in messaging move upgrade back to messaging again or oh uh, or this one I. So there's there's the discussion of of we've gone back and forth on this several times. Where does upgrade belong, and where do, do the transfer codings right now are split awkwardly between semantics and and uh, messaging, um, because TE is used for version non-specific semantics, unfortunately. Um, for upgrades. Oh, no, that, that isn't this issue. Sorry, this is this is separate. Yeah, part um, of this issue is you know, that it also defines protocol and a couple other things that are used in the document. And then, um, gosh, I can't remember. There are other. It's it's kind of messy to have it in messaging because then it has to it has to point to lots of things in semantics, and then if it's in Semantics is kind of messy because it's really a 1.1 only header field. I think the idea was we put it in semantics and we actually say in the upgrade header field that it only applies to 1.1. Mm. Um, but I'm not sure if that would be what Martin wanted us to do or. That'd be fine. Uh, I was just looking to make sure that it, it had been considered. I, I understand the complexity of trying to extricate the the, t the necessary 1.1 specific text. But if, you, if you're willing to say that, that upgrade is defined in the following fashion, but it really only applies to 1.1, then I think we're probably okay. I don't think semantics has any normative reference now to messaging, and that wouldn't necessarily create one. So yep. I think that's fine. Okay. I think another motivation was that we wanted to have as few header fields that were version specific as possible. Um, if they happen to not be useful or or honored in a particular version, I think that's fine. But you know, version specific headers is something we shouldn't steer people towards in general. Yeah, and the ones that we have are very awkward. <laughs> yes, that that we have learned that. Yes. Unfortunately, this one is also very awkward, but um, I, I don't think we fix that by moving it. Okay. So leave it in semantics, it sounds like. Yeah. Julian, did you want to chime in? Yeah, I wanted to comment on Martin's uh, question whether we have normative references from semantics to messaging. Uh, that's actually a different ticket, I think. Um, of the ones that he found, and uh, I, I just wanted to remind people about that one is um, we require the resp we require the response format of the trace method to use um, the HTTP message media type, and that media type is defined in terms of HTTP 1.1 messaging. There, there may be a few other things, but that's the one that uh, was obvious to me that if we actually want to fully decouple semantics from 1.1, we actually have to kill that requirement for trace. Okay. 
So when an H when an H two um, server receives a trace request via H two, what does it do? Yep. Good question. So my my suggestion there was that um, the semantic level requirement was that the server the server or intermediary in this case um, produce a um, a response that contains the message that it receives and not necessarily specify the format in semantics and then uh, have a, a, an informative reference saying that they could use the HTTP 1 1 wire format and there are plenty of other inform informative references to the messaging doc for that purpose and this would just be one more. Cool. All right. Um, I should mention a time check. Do we want to go through anything more here, or should we go to our last? We should move on. Yeah, that's great. Think we should <laughs> okay. So I don't have slides. So this is a spec um, that I put together with uh, Yichen and Stephen, uh, I believe we're both on the call, um, for a new response header field that has pretty much the exact same syntax and semantics as cache control, uh, but it is targeted at CDNs. And the reason for that is that CDNs now all do this themselves in various ways, and there are subtle differences in the practice in each one. So there's a you know, Fastly specific way to do this. There's an Akamai specific way to do this. There's a Cloudflare specific way to do this. As well as for other uh, CDNs, it's a very common use case for a content provider to want to cache differently in the CDN where they control, they have a, a relationship with a cache and from, from, from other caches where they don't have a relationship with that cache. And, and so having a separate control mechanism is, is great and, and really useful and, and is now very common practice, but it, it's problematic to have all these different CDN specific ones, because if you change CDNs, you have to change the headers you send, not only the name of the header, but also you have to figure out what the right semantics are for that particular CDN because there are subtle differences. Um, and, and so for me, the, the main driver for interop here is I want third party frameworks like WordPress or Symfony or whoever else to be able to emit a, a, a cache control header for CDNs, knowing that it will be uh, honored properly uh, by a CDN that implements this without having to have different plugins for different CDNs or, or whatever else they want to do. Um, it's, it's a fairly straightforward interoperability uh, uh, ask. Um, and, and the discussion around this seems to have so far mostly been around, well, what about other non-CDN uh, caches um, that might want their own special uh, cache control header. And indeed, what about, what if you have cache control that you want a specific CDN to pay attention to over the general CDN advice um, uh, because you're doing multi-CDN, which is actually quite common now. And and there's, a, there's an appendix, I think we've made an appendix. Uh, down here. Uh, where you can create your own one. Uh, you can create another version of CDN cache control, for example, uh, with the same syntax and semantics. And I, I think really what we, and the other use cases of what if I build my own CDN or what if there's a, a, another kind of reverse proxy, like a localized reverse proxy that's a different layer of caching that I want to target. And I think what we really need here is a generic targeted cache control mechanism um, that allows you to target the different layers, and one of those layers might be generic CDNs, and I, I believe strongly that that's a target that needs to be distinct uh, for that interoperability purpose that I explained. Um, and, and, and what I would propose is that if the working group adopts this specification, we turn it into that kind of framework where it, it allows you to uh, um, create different forms of cache control. Um, no, I'm not defining a header field name suffix. I'm <laughs> defining a convention, Martin. You know how I hate prefixes and suffixes in registries. Um, nice try. Um, but in other words, code wouldn't 
key off of the cache control suffix. It's just a convention, much like content dash. Um, I think the, the discussion that needs to be had here is, is in, in back channel with folks, one, maybe two people have suggested, well, why don't we just have one mega cache control header to do this rather than having multiple headers? And I'm even though we have structured headers now, I think that is much more complex. It's much less human friendly. Um, it, 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 it's more liable to uh, uh, implementation errors. And I say that because that's kind of how surrogate control. I was the person who specified surrogate control way back in, I guess it was 2000 or 2001, and it really didn't work out well. Um, it was too complex, it was over-specified, and I really don't want to walk that down that road again. It's much simpler just to say, uh, to, to do the, the multiplexing between the different layers of caching at the header level and say, here's the generic cache control header, here's the CDN cache control header, and here's the cache control header for that guy over there. Um, that, that to me is much simpler and, and more straightforward. It means we can reuse people's understanding of cache control as it works today, rather than inventing something complex and new that people have to understand. Um, I, I think that's all I really have to say, but I'd, I'd ask the working group to consider adopting this as a starting point. All right. Sorry, header, header field, sorry, not headers. Okay. Anyone want to chime in other than snarky comments on the chat? Support, not support. James. Uh, in, in, so this multi CDN thing, uh, would it not be an idea to, to uh, add that as an additional, um, I'm going to mess up my terminology, key or, or, or something as part of the list as part of the value of the header? I, I doubt that people will be using more than two or three uh, CDNs in this, right? Right, so the idea is that the CDN, the, the one that we define here would be the one for basically any CDN that I am using, pay attention to this header. And that could, that would cover multi CDN. Okay, well, other CDNs like point, uh, if you needed specific instructions for, then you wouldn't parameterize the main one. You would just have a different header field. Yes, that that's the current approach. Yes, exactly. Um, Corey says, "Sure, why not?" I have other CDNs other than the three indicated interest. Uh, I've heard. On the list and in back channel interest from uh, people who implement software who can be that can be used as to create a CDN. Yes. Um, frankly, we don't have great communication with other CDNs yet. Okay. So, some support. Does anyone have any problems with us adopting this? I, I think it's something we can. Take to the list, but it seems that there is, you know, some interest and engagement on it. Certainly, and it's, and it's good to see that there is a variety of uh, companies involved in the authorship of this one. To start at three is good. Martin says no objection. Not much discussion thus far. Yeah, I think the the key thing sounds like it would be just making sure that. All the CDN operators that we know of are interested and supportive, but yeah. it seems like we have a good start. So for what it's worth, I've talked to Fastly Engineering about this, and they're excited to implement yeah. as long as it stays simple. Okay. Cool. All right. Yeah. Okay. We can make a call for adoption. Okay. Good timing too. Yeah, how, how about we do do it once once we ship core? Oh sure. No, I meant just it's nine fifty nine here, so ah yes, we're at the end of the day. So um, I think that's all we have, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, actually on that point, um, so folks should uh, uh, we're done with the working group last call. But if you see any more issues uh, uh, that that you think need to be resolved, please do bring them up, and we'll try and get some drafts out. I, I think Tommy, we talked about. Putting another set of drafts out, giving people a couple of days just to look and make sure yeah. that the issues are incorporated correctly, and then we'll ship them off. Yep. No. Okay. Work on shipper write-ups and all that nice fun stuff. Alrighty, thank you, everyone. Productive meetings. Thanks for taking your time out of your days.
Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.